appreciate so much the opportunity to share with you one of the loves I have uh, about history and the importance of Missouri history. I appreciate very much the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, Stacy and John and others have really been very helpful in making arrangements and making us feel comfortable. About a year ago, I had the opportunity to speak to the Association of Retired Missouri National Guardsmen in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And the director of the group advised me on two important things about speaking. He said, first of all, keep it under 30 minutes. The second thing, speak real loud to this group. So I'm not sure I wasn't given any other directives tonight, but we're going to try to have some fun with it anyway. Hopefully you have an outline that we passed out. Uh, if you haven't, uh, holler and we'll try to get you one. But it kind of indicates the outline we want to try to follow. And if nothing else, it'll help you know about when to start waking up, because we're about done. So keep that in mind. Let me begin. Why did I write this book? I've written several other books about people or organizations of great significance of which no book had been written. When I retired from Arkansas back to Missouri in 2012, I told a friend I was not sure what I could write about in Missouri. And he suggested Fort Leonard Wood. And I found out that on December 2015, it was the 75th anniversary of its creation. I checked on the internet and found that there were no books ever written about its history, even though over two million people have gone through the fort and basic training. I began the journey with three concerns. First, I did not have any personal military experience. Second, I knew very little about proper military protocol. Third, I had no knowledge of the hundreds of military acronyms being used today. <laughs> The historians on base, and they had historians at that time, they're kind of a lost breed now with all of the cuts, but at that time the historians told me that uh, first of all, uh, having no military experience would probably actually allow me to be a little more objective in my writing. I didn't harbor any long-held grudges or hatreds of any drill sergeant. <laughs> They also promised to guide me through my military protocol as needed. They also indicated that they too didn't know many of the acronyms that they were faced with every day. So the journey began. Fort Lost in the Woods in the State of Misery. That's how many of the people I interviewed described the place. That's how many of the draftees referred to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have visited Fort Leonard Wood? Show of hands. Oh, my goodness. All right, now then let me ask, how many of you have actually served in the military at Fort Leonard Wood? On behalf of all the rest of us, let me issue a very heartfelt thank you. I appreciate that very, very much. You would think that a book about Fort Leonard Wood is a book all about things military. But the history of Fort Leonard Wood is really all about people, citizens as well as soldiers. A clear example is from this photo that's on display here. I did a television interview uh, just as I was beginning writing the book, uh, telling the audience what I was wanting and if they had any help or information contact me through the uh, television station. The next day I got an email from a lady in East Springfield, Peggy Lejeune. She said, my father was one of the early construction crew workers that built Fort Leonard Wood. And uh, he's gone. Uh, I'm the only one left in the family. And he has some old photos. If you don't want them, I'm going to throw them away. Isn't that what an archivist loves to hear? <laughs> yeah. So boy, I beelined to her. And she had this wonderful photograph. And this is a digital copy. The original was brown and just a little crinkly. But the publisher saw that and loved it. 
and said, this is going to be our wraparound cover. And we made a digital copy of it. But it's sad to me how many wonderful things we have in Missouri in people's closets and everywhere else that's just going to be lost unless they're donated or given. Peggy was very gracious to donate the original to the museum at Fort Leonard Wood. And they now have that in their archives. I think it's important to recognize this photo was taken October the 14th, 1941, just before Pearl Harbor. And I wondered how many of these workers would return just a couple months later as draftees. And it is all about people, people who built the base, people who served on the base, people who continue the operation today. I think civilians are a very important support group for the base operations today. The book that I wrote was made possible by the contributions of many people. There are personal interviews with former soldiers. One guy I asked what he remembered about Fort Leonard Wood, and he said he tried to forget everything he remembered. <laughs> there are locals who worked on the base. There are families that have been affected very much by the, the military base. And their stories are all the focus of this book, and it is for the people that this book was dedicated. I originally asked some, some of the officers on, on base about perhaps dedicating the book to a General Leonard Wood, and they said, no, 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 it needs to go to the people. Because without the people, we couldn't operate. We wouldn't still be in existence. We'll explain why. I want to try to answer and address some of the questions that I raised in my own research and the writing of this book. And then we'll allow time, hopefully, to hear from you questions or perhaps stories that you would love to share or could share in public, let's say, about your experiences. I had several interesting uh, interviews. Uh, some of which could not be written in a book. So anyway, number one, why would a military training camp be placed in the central Missouri Hill Country? You may or may not know that the Army originally had planned to establish a military base in Leon, Iowa, southern Iowa. But as the time drew near for the actual construction to begin, it was discovered that the Iowa location water table had dropped considerably. That posed dramatic increased cost and challenges for an adequate water supply. A campaign was begun to search for a new location. After some searching, the location of the present base was recommended. There was available land already under federal control with the Mark Twain National Forest. And there was a sparse population that allowed for additional land to be purchased, not without some controversy, I might add. The varied terrain also aided in the training, and that was an important consideration, and still is today. Second question, and this one I wrestle with, still wrestle with a little bit. Why would a military training base in Missouri not be named after Missouri's General John Blackjack Pershing. You would think that. Pershing was from north central Missouri and is a very popular figure in military history. The commanding general of the American forces in World War I had national and international acclaim. He was a great military tactician and that was an important consideration. Leonard Wood was a medical doctor who led the forces in the Spanish-American War and commanded forces in Cuba. And actually, he is the one who created the Rough Riders of Historical Fame. A little footnote here. Theodore Roosevelt was his second in command. But Theodore Roosevelt brought with him a whole group of photographers and press people that gave him all of the, the photos. Anyway, Leonard Wood is the one who created that. Prior to World War I, Wood was a national voice calling out the need for military preparedness for a pitifully armed nation at that time. His opposition to a popular President Wilson, who vowed to keep us out of war, put Wood in political disfavor. Even though Wood was the highest ranking army officer 
At the beginning of World War I, command of the battle forces was given to Pershing. Wood was relegated to stay at home and helped establish military training bases. And he became associated with military preparedness and training. And to me, that may have been the one rationale why he was selected and to have the name for this fort. Third, how could a military training camp for over 20,000 soldiers be constructed in the winter of 1940 within three months? The directive from President Roosevelt went out in 1940 for the construction of numerous military bases after the national draft was narrowly approved. And if I remember my history right, it was approved by one vote in the U.S. Senate. With the effects of the Great Depression still being felt by many in rural areas, the prospects for employment was very welcomed by the locals. The local population at that time was around 250 people, and they saw an immediate influx of over 30,000 construction workers. They all faced harsh challenges. The unusually wet winter weather, the limited road access, the lack of modern tools, and the press of a time schedule all weighed heavily with them. Skilled craftsmen and assistant tradesmen worked in the three eight-hour shifts around the clock with many of the local residents providing a bed and meals for each of the three shifts. I remember interviewing some who remembered that their parents had a chicken coop. And when they were starting to construct the base, they got rid of all the chickens. They built three-tier bunk beds, and they rented out each bed on eight-hour shifts for the workers. And they made a lot more money than they ever did with the chickens. <laughs> Within three months, these workers built barracks, training facilities, roads, water lines, sewer systems, power systems, communication systems, and office buildings. What really surprised me, March the 22nd, 1941, the federal government issued the largest payroll check in its history at that time to the workers at the new Missouri base. The check was for $1,342,000 $418.79. The local banks could not cash all the checks. Armored cars from St. Louis and Kansas City banks came to cash the checks for the workers. But by April 1941, the base was completed for the troops who had already started arriving for training. Number four. How could over 250,000 soldiers be trained for combat in World War II at this base? Over a five-year period, the American public provided record numbers of armaments for the United States and the Allied nations. Training at the local bases increased as the need for additional troops and replacement troops also increased. Training schedules were actually shortened to get new troops on the field. Additional facilities were built to accommodate the increased training and housing needs. I remember talking with some from uh, New Jersey, and they came and they came in, I think it was in June and July of uh, 1944, I think it was, and they were from New Jersey. They'd never been to Missouri for one thing. They never had Missouri heat and humidity and they had never worn a pair of boots in their life. And they were pretty miserable by the time they finished their basic training. So it was a real wake-up call for many of these troops. 1946, the base was deactivated, much to everyone's surprise. And how could a deactivated Army base be transformed into an active training base within one month? At the end of World War II, Fort Leonard Wood was deactivated in spite of its original intent. The previously enjoyed financial benefits for the community now suddenly disappeared. Only a new cattle ranch 
made use of the deserted base. After the announcement of U.S. military involvement in Korea in 1950, Fort Leonard Wood was reactivated for use with orders to have it ready within one month. I remember talking to a guy from Phoenix, Arizona on the phone, called me and told me that I think he was 93 years old and said he was one of the first ones to arrive in 1950. And what he remembered was there were shrubs growing up in the doors of the barracks uh, he remembered digging ditch after ditch after ditch after ditch. That was pretty much all of his memory of Fort Leonard Wood. But they got it ready within a month. Local citizens rose to the occasion. Again, the people arose to prepare the base for use. The prospects of potential financial gain, as well as a patriotic duty, motivated the work to be completed on schedule. Number six, how could a local Missouri community persuade the United States Army to declare permanency for its military training base? Knowing the hardship of another likely deactivation, local citizens banded together to petition politicians and military leaders about the need to make Fort Leonard Wood a permanent military training base. A local group known as the Committee of 50, led by Drew Pippen of Waynesville, was very effective in printing informative brochures, holding public information meetings, and making personal contacts with politicians and military leaders. In January 1958, the base was finally declared a permanent training facility. And how could a military training base designed to train 30,000 soldiers a year actually train over 100,000 soldiers in 1967? With the growing demands for troops and replacements in the Vietnam War, Fort Leonard Wood became a key center for basic training and specialized training of military engineers. Jungle warfare required new training techniques and facilities that the base quickly adopted. Available land also provided for 10 cities to be set up on base, increasing the number of trainees. The peak of the training numbers took place in 1967 when over 123,000 soldiers were trained in that one year alone. When the national economy required periods of military elimination and consolidation, how could this Missouri training camp actually grow in size when many were shrinking or disappearing? In the culture of the national base consolidations and eliminations, Fort Leonard Wood had several important advantages. First, the base was not landlocked like several other military bases. Second, major population centers were far removed from the base, allowing for explosives and other weapons training. And third, Missouri was fortunate to have some political clout, especially with Representative Ike Skelton, who at that time was chairman of the House Military Appropriations Committee. That didn't hurt the Ford's prospects at all. In fact, some on the fort refer to Ike Skelton as the patron saint of Fort Leonard Wood. We now have Senator Claire McCaskill as a ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. So we've had that kind of important clout in the state. And four, Missouri citizens were learning the lessons of effective lobbying on behalf of the military base. Nine. How could the Central Missouri military base become the national center for engineering, military police, biological chemical, and diesel transportation training for all branches of the military service? The national economy and the need for efficiency of training caused the military to evaluate the traditional spending of, out of the military training contracts. Centralizing the special training of troops reduced cost for travel and for operation. 
even among all the military branches, not just the Army, but all branches of military service receive specialized training today at Fort Leonard Wood in engineering, military police, biological chemical warfare, and even diesel transportation maintenance. It is said that one out of seven Marines has their training at Fort Leonard Wood. BASE also provides international specialized training. Number 10, how can Fort Leonard Wood continue to serve Missouri and the nation? As changes in the military occur, the centralization of training is even more important. There is still room for growth on the base at Fort Leonard Wood, and there is ongoing construction for all branches of military service on the base. Expansion of the base airport is absolutely essential to its growth with the local support. The base is increasing in its efforts at sustainability by decreasing at every possible way the cost of operations. And they have a goal set within a few years to be zero sustainability for the expenses as well as the ability to uh, pay for those. Citizen groups continue to offer effective lobbying in, in support of the base. The most effective group today is the Sustainable Ozarks Partnership, called the SOP. The importance of the base needs to be acknowledged beyond just its surrounding counties. It is a major employer for the state of Missouri. It is also an important source of tourism for soldiers and their visiting families. I've had the opportunity of doing about 10 book signings on base and I have enjoyed so much at the PX, meeting people and families from all over the world who come to Fort Leonard Wood. And Missouri has a real impression on them, and we need to be grateful for the opportunity that we have. All right. I'm rushing, but we get to the conclusion here. The book attempts to show Missourians the contributions made by a nationally vital military installation having trained over two million soldiers in its now 78 history. The book deals with the issues faced by the housing of prisoners of war. We had Italians and Germans that were uh, placed on base, prisoners of war. The reports and the interviews that I've read from some of those who returned years later in visiting said they cried when they had to leave Fort Leonard Wood because they knew that they were going back to a totally destroyed Germany, or totally destroyed Italy. And they really appreciated the good care that was given to them on base as well as off base. The book also deals with the challenges faced by blacks. Before the integration of the service, blacks at Fort Leonard Wood, and I think there were about 4,000 at one time, uh, they had a lot of discrimination on base as well as off reading some of their stories. Some were really upset when they were not allowed to eat in the main mess uh, tents uh, provided for the regular soldiers. They had to have their own separate uh, eating place. And they were shocked when they saw the German prisoners of war being invited into the main mess hall where they couldn't go in. And one of the blacks raised the question, what are we fighting for? So there was some real bitterness on the parts of the people there. You may not be aware, but Fort Leonard Wood was the first military base, and it was called gender integration. They provided basic training for male and female, very first base. There's only three bases today that still do that. But Fort Leonard Wood was a major leader in that field. It's interesting that today, when you see all of that progression, today, the base is now led by a black female commanding officer, Major General Donna Martin. Just as the people came together to build the fort in the woods, only by people coming together with some knowledge about the base will it be assured of continuing to benefit our state and serve our nation. We need to become more aware of the base we have and of its significance. 
Visit the base if you have not, especially their very interesting museums. Buy the book, share it with others. <laughs> Search their very informative website that they have for us, the citizens. Discover and join the working of the Sustainable Ozarks Partnership. The future sustainability of the base is indeed a community effort. I was asked by one person, a member of the National Guardsman, I think, what it was like to write a book about Fort Leonard Wood. And I told him about the story I heard of the guy who drank a whole quart of varnish and died. They said he had a horrible death, but he did have a wonderful finish. <laughs> <laughs> Writing a book is sometimes not that. There were some wonderful times on base. There were some very challenging times. Kind of early on, the librarians were really encouraging me to do this because they saw some of their uh, archival material disappearing. They were losing it. They were concerned that there was an accurate account written. They took me to see one of the uh, uh, second-in-command person on base. I won't tell you his name for personal reasons, but uh, he was not happy with me and was not happy with my project and informed me I would not be allowed to do any research on base and anything I did write had to be approved by the uh, Public Affairs Office and PAO, I remember that was preventing access to offices, how we called it, but PAO, and then anything I wrote had to be sent and had to be censored by the PAO. Well, I knew that was ridiculous. I'm a private citizen, I pay taxes, all the materials I was searching had been declassified. The librarians were just really upset about this. We had a meeting, and they asked me if, uh, what I thought about it, and I told them I was kind of discouraged at that point. I didn't want to get them in trouble, obviously, but I didn't feel I was being treated very fairly. And a retired librarian from Rolla talked to me and said, you know, the last thing they want on base is a House of Representatives investigation. Why don't you contact your congressman? Tell them what's going on. And I did, and I contacted my uh, representative, and he sent a letter back, would you like for me to have an official investigation? And I said, you bet so, and I signed the form. About six weeks later, he sent me, the congressman, a copy of a letter he received from the head public affairs officer for the Army. And it was directed to the commanding general at Fort Leonard Wood. And it said, not only did I have every right to do research, they were not to ask for any kind of censoring at all. And they were to provide any and all assistance they could in my work. <coughs> The librarians asked if they could have copies of that letter. <laughs> the librarians did, went out of their way to help me. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but one of them in the engineer department said, you know, I'm going to leave for about an hour and a half lunch. I can't help you with specific materials, but I really have an interesting book I'm reading that's open on my desk when I leave. <laughs> so that kind of help they gave there was an intern from high school that was working on base, and they assigned him to help me. Any photocopying I need, anything, he was there to help. They just really went out of their way. Now, it's sad to me that even with some of the base closures and things, even though they gained a lot of other things on base, they lost a lot of what was called non-essential support. And the librarians were the big ones. And there are very hardly any librarians at all on Fort Leonard Wood now, sadly. And that's why they were just so happy when this book came out, that at least there was an account written for that. Now, I've tried to answer a few questions I had about the research and the writing of the book, and I would hope that, that there certainly are questions you may have that I will try to answer as best I can. And perhaps if you would just like to maybe share some of your own personal experiences you're able to share in the public about Fort Leonard Wood, we would encourage you to do that.